Um, the committees are encouraged to meet and develop their plans. And if you not, are not on a committee or are not a committee member, um, but have a desire to serve in some capacity, please contact that committee. Um, also, on that list, um, we're trying to put together um, a calendar right now of our activities for the year. We're trying to be proactive and you know let everybody know when the next meetings are, you know, or activities. So um, if you have not nominated a chairperson for your ministry or the committee um, that you're in, and you'll see the list, it'll have a C next to it if there is a designated committee um, chair. But if there is none, then I need you to get together with the people in your group and decide who's gonna be the chair. Because we're gonna start handing out calendars and then you folks are gonna tell us what kind of activities you folks have that we need to put on the calendars. Okay, so we need that information and it's a work in progress. So um, I know we have asked this um, previously when we first um, brought this um, committee checklist um, to us. We had asked you to meet with your group, find out um, who's gonna be chairing, if it's gonna be a co-chair or two people, um, so just someone that will lead the group and be in charge of that group. So if you don't have a C in the group that you're signed up for, um, please come to me and or Auntie Sandy or Auntie Sarah because we're the ones that are trying to compilate all of this information. Okay. All right. Also, thank you um, to those who helped with our BCM's Volcano Hanui. Um, if you would like to continue to assist with few future activities or needs, you can see um, Wendy or you can contact her on the phone number listed there. Um, to find out about God, uh, how God is working in and through Hawaii uh, Pacific Baptist, you can also view the Pacific Connector magazine. And they have a January, February 2024 issue that's already um, online and we have the website listed there. All right, if you are a first time visitor, so my boy is in the back, um, if you can, if somebody hasn't already give, given them a welcome um, form, if they can just fill up that form so we can keep in touch with you guys too. And if you would like further information on how to commit to Christ, um, please commit, uh, complete our decision information form, which is also located in the back. Um, one more thing, our coffee. If you walked back there this morning and found that the coffee machine was gone, <laughs> Our coffee has been relocated into the sound room um, just because the circuit is out in that area so you cannot run our coffee machine. So if you need coffee or tea, it's located um, right in the back side of the sound room area. Anything else, Anthony? Are we pretty much covered? All right. So with that, let's go ahead and open in prayer and begin our um, service. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, um, thank you so much for just um, really being with us in 2024 and as we strive to um, go forward in your word dear lord we pray that we really place our hearts our mind and our soul um, on your true purpose and your real goals dear lord we thank you for this wonderful church dear lord for all of the people that serve you and we pray that you continue to fill our hearts with joy as we serve. And for those that um, want to serve, dear Lord, that they may be able to come forward and um, really serve the Lord um, in the field that you have already placed them in. Lord, we continue to pray for a pastor for our church. We um, know that you have him ready. And Lord, so we patiently wait upon you. We continue to pray um, for this. And Lord, we um, just thank you for all that you continue to provide. Um, and to also to remind us, dear Lord, to always lean on you for all, all your um, answers to our prayers. We pray as we begin our service this morning that you will just lift us up. Dear Lord, and um, just pray that we have a really good week. 
and that we can just clear all of our worries at this time as we come to worship you and just give it to you. In all of these things, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's rise as we sing our first song when we all get to heaven.
All right. So today we are blessed with the message from Pastor Roberto Latoro. Did I say that right? I tried. <laughs> I didn't take Spanish, I took Japanese, but ours are kind of the same. But anyway, he will do a message this morning on an effective ministry of prayer. Welcome. Thank you. church in Kona. Hopefully, by God's grace and will, we will have two. One more in Ocean View. We're trying to work that out. Uh, we started a Bible study uh, last year in a community, kind of like a makeshift uh, housing project. It used to be a um, like, an, like an indoor produce swap ish <laughs> And uh, they have converted it into bedrooms, um, low-income bedrooms, and it's full of Hispanics. And one of the brothers from our church moved there. He says, Pastor, uh, there's all these people here. And I said, well, just figure out where we can, you know, put a you know, small lantern type thing and we bring worship and see what happens. And so we'd be getting about 20 to 25 people showing up at studies on Tuesday night. So that's a blessing. Uh, in preparation to go into Ocean View. Uh, the pastor that was with me, uh, Aaron, last, last uh, time I was here, uh, he is going, he already bought property in Ocean View. So he is going to move there, uh, eventually build something there and, and kind of take over. So we're going to uh, do the work and see what the Lord says. And, and we believe that, that, that uh, there's enough population there that a church will arise, even bigger than Kona. Uh, we have a transitional church in Kona, we get about somewhere between 20 to 50 people a year, and the next year is different every year, because people come, they work, and they go home, and then, so we have a ministry of sending out uh, people to the gospel call, um, preparing them while they're with us, teaching them the word of God, getting them interested in, in opening up churches where they go, and then plugging them in, hopefully, to the convention in Mexico, or a lot of them not right now that we're getting them from Honduras, um, refugees that are coming in, uh, because Honduras is what El Salvador used to be uh, about five years back, five to seven years back. So the gangbangers, La Mara Salvatrucha, have taken over the, the whole country of Honduras, and they're ramping, rapidly creating chaos. And so the people are now leaving Honduras like they used to from El Salvador. Uh, the new president in El Salvador uh, put the biggest jail in Central and South America and has housed everybody who has any gang affiliation. So they're welcome to stay with him uh, for the duration of their lives. So uh, average, average uh, sentences, uh, small sentences, 20 years, usually 30 to 40 years for being affiliated with gangs and, and harassing the people of El Salvador. So, uh, the new president of, of Honduras is trying to do the same, but it's not quite working out as, as good as uh, President Bukele did it in El Salvador. But we're praying that that will bring the gospel, and through uh, you know through through that kind of turmoil, bring people to himself. And that's usually what happens. You know, something like that happens, the gospel gets preached, and people get saved. So even if they come to us, uh, we will do our best to bring them the gospel. So today we're looking at an effective ministry of prayer. We're going to be in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 2, 36 to 38. Let me give you a little bit of background, first of all, of who Luke is. Now, Luke, we, if I ask you to give me a rundown of uh, Luke, you might just say he's a doctor and stop there. <laughs> he was a physician. He was a, he was a writer. He was a, 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 a companion of Paul. Uh, and, and there's not much to be said. And that's purposefully. Now he wrote uh, the book of Luke in, in, in Acts as a, as a combined piece. In, in Luke he writes 24 chapters. Acts has 28. So it's 52 chapters. About one third of the New uh, Testament is written by himself. And he managed writing 52 chapters and not mentioning himself one time. What a humble guy. 
I mean, if we would have run it, your name would have been on the, my name would have been on every page. Been by. <laughs> but Luke is a real humble man of God. He is a historian. He's a master of classical Greek. He, he uses you know a Greek that is compared to Paul's. I mean, he's he's a real studied person, and he's writing to an audience, a guy named Theophilus. He's he's a uh, we believe that he's um, a Gentile who funded Luke's ministry to collect and gather and write. And he also refers to him in Acts. He writes to him. <coughs> He's writing about 58 uh, and before AD and before 70. We know that for sure because he, he doesn't write about the, 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 the Jews being uh, moved away uh, forcefully by Rome out of uh, Israel. So uh, Possibly before 62, he writes. And he's writing from Caesarea Maritma, uh, Paul's companion, like I told you guys, he's there for about two years. And if you look at Luke's Gospel, it is the third book of 27 in the New Testament. So he has quite a lot of weight to what he's written. Um, we, we know that he, he writes uh, and divides the book in about six sections. The first section, what we're looking at today, is kind of like the preparation of Jesus before he takes, uh, he starts his ministry. So it's kind of like his birth, and he, he talks a little bit about his childhood, and then he goes right into uh, the ministry of Christ. So it's right in that period of time. And the purpose of the book is, is, is as much as understanding um, the things accomplished for us through Christ. He's writing all about Jesus. That's, that's the purpose of the book. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about the Lord. And he is a writing from an eyewitness uh, account. So he wasn't present, but he's going to the people who were there one-on-one -on -one with Christ. And he's interviewing them as a historian and gathering the facts and then putting it together in a way that is uh, from A through Z. So that you can kind of follow through the life of Christ from his birth to his death to his resurrection to his ascension to uh, the starting of the church all the way to the gospel of reaching Rome to the end of the world, right? So it's, it's kind of cool the way <laughs> nobody else did that. He, he, he did it so that we could kind of read through the whole time of a period of time and say, wow, from the, from, the, from the conception to the death to the church being alive and the gospel being preached in Rome. I mean, it's, it's really put together really well, really well for us. And he's writing so that you may know the truth about the things you have been taught to Theophilus. So Theophilus is a believer. And Theophilus wanted to find out, what will, you know, I, I get all these notes from people, and people are talking about them. Peter saying this, and the apostle, and the church is growing, but I want to know from A through Z. And he's like, yeah, let, let me get that for you. So he found something to do that. The message of the book is life costly, uh, Life, live a costly discipleship life. Because to be a disciple of Christ is going to be costly to you. Truly. And if it's not, wait for it. <laughs> it will come. Shorma will come. He's a historian, a, a narrative gospel writer. His emphasis of the book is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's really interested in the ministry. Of, he's, a, he's, a, he's a physician. So anything the Spirit of God does to heal somebody, it's like, I'm all over that. I want to know how he did that. I want to tell you that there was no hand, and then next thing you know, a hand was there, and, and there was no ability to move, and next thing you know, there's movement there, and there's no eyes, and it pops up, and it's, and it's crystal clear, 2020. I mean, that's what really moves him to write, and he, he loves all those little stories about healing and about the Spirit working. He points out the angels and uh, uh, to, to declare that the deity of Christ, the angels always come up and they're always talking about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as, as God himself, Emmanuel, God with us. And he's, uh, he's talking about the redemptive history of Israel, uh, a lot of mention of Isaiah. So the book of Isaiah is all over his writings. Um, and, and it's kind of cool because you, you can spend years Trace it back. Oh, that's for myself. Oh, that's for myself. And you can trace it back. And he talks about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem from Luke 9 to, uh, chap to chapter 18. How Christ was preparing himself to give his life for us on the cross. And Luke writes about that. 
He writes about the ministry of Christ to the children and to the women. He really, he really wants to focus us that, that, that Christ is not just the Savior of all the men, but he's like, no, no, listen. He loved to save the women. He loved the children. He wants to talk about that. He talks about the ministry to the Gentiles. How Christ did not, uh, did not just move towards Israel. That was his main priority, but he also expanded and invited the Gentiles to come to him. The title of the book might be uh, like this, Jesus Christ, Prophet of God and the Son of Man. And you may see it that way uh, as, we, as we look through it. Now, when you talk about prayer, it is probably the saddest thing that you come to a prayer meeting. Because it's the service that usually has the least amount of people. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you come to prayer meeting. I'm just going to ask you to think about it. Right? My Christ is saying at the temple that the house of God should be known as a house of? And that's the last service we want to go to. We'll go to a potluck. We'll go to a funeral and all show up. Seriously. We go to a wedding, invite somebody to a prayer meeting, they're like, oh, I have, you know. <laughs> well, you know. And Christ says, listen, guys, my house, my place of worship, my place of, of, of bringing people together for the purpose of, of collectively building each other up through the ministry of the Spirit of God and through the work of God in you is for you to be praying, to be praying. To be talking to the Lord through the scripture and through praying. To, 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 to love the Lord so much and trust Him so much that you bring every petition before Him and, and know that He will do according to His perfect will. My house should be known as a house of prayer. Well, not recently. <laughs> not recently. And, and, and it's a, that's why I'm talking to you guys about an effective ministry of prayer. And I don't know, I'm not talking about your church. I, I haven't been to your prayer meetings. So I'm, I'm guilty <laughs> of one of those that didn't show up, right? I haven't been. I don't know if everybody shows up. I mean, I might be talking to, you know, to, to a church that everybody shows up. I don't know. But I'm just saying that in general, when you go to most Baptist churches, because I don't go to any other, Baptist, the other church that's Baptist, so when I go to most Baptist churches, and you ask the pastor, how's your prayer meeting? They're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> we have three <laughs> now George Mueller I don't know if you ever heard about him uh, 1805 to 1898 he was a Christian missionary and evangelist uh, coordinator of the orphans in England and through his faithful life he had a life of prayer he uh, had a privilege of caring for about 120,000 orphans 120,000 and one of the things he said was that I, I am not going to let anybody know my needs except for the Lord in prayer. He did all of that without letting, you know, most of us, we're going to do a ministry, we let everybody know to see who, maybe, maybe somebody will say, hey, brother, here, here's, here's 20 bucks for the ministry. He wasn't doing that. He was praying. And in his journal, he records how God always provided provided for the children and himself through answer prayer. Through answer prayer. One morning, uh, the kids were sitting around the table uh, and the plates were set and he reminded them that uh, they must not be late for school. But there's no food in the pantry. There's not, they have plates. And they're sitting there and they pray for the food. And as he says amen, somebody knocks on the door. Well, he opens the door, and there's the baker. And he tells him, you know, last night I just couldn't sleep. All night God has, that was encouraging me to, 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 to bless you guys. So I got up early in the morning at 2 a.m. and baked all this bread for your children. He thanked them, blessed them, took the bread inside. He closes the door, and somebody else knocks. It's the milkman. My, my wagon just broke down right in front of your place. It's full of milk. I haven't delivered a, a drop. But I need them emptied. Would you guys help me by emptying the milk and using it for me so it doesn't spoil? Talk about answer prayer. What did he say about prayer? Miller, 
He said the temptation is to cease praying as though we had given up hope and to say it is useless. That's kind of the way we treat prayer sometimes. Or as a genie or as a 911 call, right? I was that never to, to the Lord uh, uh, prayer. That's, that's the one. <laughs> and as long as, as, as we pray, God acts in our life in a way that is miraculous. And you can actually give a testimony. See, prayer meetings should be full of people coming before you, letting you know how they pray. And God reacted to the prayer by bringing about changing you, changing the community, changing others, and how he presented himself to be alive in you through prayer. Having a prayer life, it means that the Spirit of God is not doing nothing with you. And that you do not trust God. Trust my wallet. Trust my friend. Trust my dad, my mom. I don't trust God. It's the same thing. And this is what Satan wants us to do. To steadily forget about praying and doing our will. Our will be done. Because that's what happens. When we move away from prayer, you're going to be doing your own will. You're getting no guidance. So we're looking at an effective ministry of prayer. Luke chapter 2, 36 to 38. Now let me tell you something about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, it says that any, anything must be proven by at least three witnesses. And this is a part of three witnesses that are saying this child of God is, is, is the child of God. He is Christ. He is the Redeemer. He is the promised Messiah. And so you're going to see that we have two of them who are really young. Joseph and Mary. 13, 14. And you have two of them that are kind of oldish. The Bible says, I didn't say it. So don't, don't, don't quote me. I'm just saying what the Bible says. So one of them was married, and after seven years, she was widowed. So if they married about 13, she was about 20. And then she decided to give her life to the ministry of prayer and being in the temple serving. And it talks about 84. Now, you can say it this way. Was she 84 when this happened, or was she 104? Because you had the 20, right? Either way, she was advancing age, doing this ministry. So, and, 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 and we, we, we can see this, that, that God was saying, look, as Mary and Joseph are going to be one of the witnesses, and, 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 and this woman and this old man are going to be the other witnesses, we have three witnesses. Them together, because Joseph knew I haven't touched her. She's pregnant, and she's new, and he hasn't touched me, and I'm pregnant. And they knew because the angel came and let them know what happened, and it was from the Lord. And the others were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, and they, they knew automatically that this baby was the promise of God. Nobody had to tell them. They knew. And they give a witness to that, and that's where we are. <coughs> And no doubt prayer ministry in many churches has fallen from grace, like I told you. It often reflects the ineffectiveness of the church in committing uh, to Christ. Yeah. Think about that. Christ said, my house should be known as a house of prayer. We're not committing to him. Now, money issue is no issue. You ask for money, people give. Time and obedience is. Prayer says it takes time and it takes obedience. And, and that's an issue for us. Many churches don't have time to evangelize. Think about it. When was the last time you guys gathered after a service and say, hey, let's go to Hilo Mall and evangelize as a church? Time and obedience. I mean, you might do it individually as a person. You know, you might talk about Christ to a friend who's, you know, ne next to you at your post at work. You might say, hey, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I went to service last. You know, it was kind of cool. Pastor talked too much. But, I mean, but, but other than that, do, do you go as a church to do the ministry of evangelism? To do the ministry of visitation? People are sick, people are not well, people are not showing up. Do you have a committee that says, hey, we're going to take the six, seven people, and we're going to take the Lord's uh, a deacon with us, 
said, so, so, no, Pastor, yeah, right, but we take a deacon, and we're going to have communion with that person. Let them know that we went back to the fellowship of Christ. Let them know that they're important to us. The community involvement, effective ministry, if, if you will. If you will. And that takes obedience and time. And it all starts with prayer. When you look at the gospel, uh, uh, sorry, of, of the book of Acts, it, it's always around prayer. Things happen around prayer meetings. Things happen about people gathering, they're praying. And the apostles are always talking about, hey, let, let's not take away from prayer. Let's not take away from prayer. And they're praying, and, and, and God is working in a miraculous way around the church through prayer. Christ told the apostles, pray with me just a little while. They fell asleep. <laughs> so you're not the only ones. And I'm not the only one. <laughs> They could hang with Christ in prayer. But Christ knew it was important to teach them that prayer is important. Prayer, beloved, is a gift of God. Prayer is a gift of God. It is an open line of communication between Almighty God and His people, the people He loved, the people He died for. You know why most people get divorced? Lack of communication. <clears throat> what do we do with the Lord? Lack of communication. That's why we do not know His will for our lives. We're always asking everybody, what should I do? What should I do? And I, I was like that as a young pastor. I had a lot of issues because I didn't know anything. I just, you know, I jumped in. I'm like, okay, I'm here. <laughs> well, <laughs> and sometimes I had issues that were bigger than me. I was 26 years old and I had people older than me with Issues that I've never seen in my life, and I'm like, oh boy, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> let, let me, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and I'll get on the phone, Dad. Yes, son, I have a problem. This is supposed to be between me and the sister and the brother, but look, I need, I need to tell you because I need somebody's guidance. And I call my dad, and my dad would say, Oh, yeah, did you pray? Uh, well, stop right there, go pray. Go read the scriptures, and then call me back, and I'll give you some guidance then. And it was, it was always that, you know? And when my, past, my dad passed away, I felt a void in my life that was huge, because I thought he was giving me all this advice, but he, his advice was one. Did you pray? He was consistent. Did you pray? No, Dad, I got upset. Well, then go pray. Did you pray? No, Dad, I was scared. Well, then go pray. Did you pray? No, that the doctor said, don't forget about the doctor. Did you pray? God is saying the same thing to us. Do you pray? Do you pray? It is a call of a means of grace. Out of the love and the kindness of God, He allows us to communicate directly to Him, right bypassing all things and all people. Right through the throne of God, right in front of Him to communicate with Him. What a privilege you have as a church to come before the Lord, the Almighty King, who's sitting at the throne, and to say, Lord, I have a problem. And I said, I know. I've been waiting for you. I, I have the solution. I knew the solution before you were born, before the creation of the world. And I know the solution, and I was waiting for you just to ask so that you would receive. Just to knock so that I can open doors for you. He has to look around so that you can find it. But you can't do that unless you're communicating with him. And it takes faith to pray. Faith to believe God can do. Prayer is an act of worship because those who pray find God worthy of communication. God is so important that I want to talk to him. If we find God as worthy, then He is worthy. How do we know that? Well, we will pray more. You can't say God is worthy and not pray. You can't say I praise Him and not pray. You can't say I love Him and not talk to Him. Hello? <laughs> Am I alone? <laughs> right? I adore you. Did you talk to me? You know, I had a girlfriend like that in high school. 
Oh man, I loved her. I care for her. I mean, I would die for her. But I hadn't talked to her once. <laughs> I never asked her to go out with me. Never. But man, I, anything you want, anytime, any place, any day. And sometimes that's, that's the way we are with the Lord. We don't communicate with Him, but we think, oh yeah, you know, you should know. You should know. You should know, Lord. I don't need to tell you. He can read my heart. <laughs> Why do you think He asks us to pray? It's not for Him. It's for you. So that you would know that your spirit will intertwine with the Spirit of God to let you know you're a child of God. Now, Paul talks about prayer, and that's the first of, of the readings that we'll do today. And don't worry, I'll be short. I know last time I was getting scoldings. <laughs> so, I'll be short. And Paul writes in um, about prayer. And he always talks about rejoicing. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. <clears throat> and as Paul writes, he says to always rejoice. He says nothing should let you be down. If, even if it's something that is not something you expected, something you want, always rejoice. Have a joyful heart. Why? Because it can be worse. It can be worse. A, a long time ago, it's not an appropriate song, but uh, on, on one of the radio stations in Oahu, they used to play right before somebody went on. And it was this guy talking about, you know, he would say something like, hey, I, you know, I got up this morning, stepped on a puddle, but it wasn't peeing. And he says, I knew it was going to be a good day. And then he goes through a bunch of those, right? So sometimes, you know, we, 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 we will step on something, and it will hurt us, but at least it wasn't worse, right? God had grace. You get into a car accident, but you're alive, and it's just a car. It's just property. The house burns down, but everybody's living. I mean, thank the Lord. We're living. And things of that nature. But we always got to rejoice. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. To, for you to be thankful, you know, and I, and I know that that's probably the most prayer that he hears is, Thank you, Lord, for my food. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, because I opened my eyes. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because I'm in bed. Amen. And, and that's the extent of some Christian's prayers. I asked a, a young man in our church to come and pray for the church at the end of service. Yeah, Pastor. He gets up there, thank you, Lord, for our food. <laughs> That's all the prayer he knew. <laughs> he knew no more. <laughs> and actually, he said, rub a dub dub, thank you, Lord, for the drug. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, followed him. I said, thank you, uh, son. Yeah, we are going to eat the word of God. And so prepare your meal. <laughs> so prayer to the Lord is a continual burnt offering before him. It is the, the smell of the church coming into the temple of God. How do you smell? Right? Think about that. It is the essence of the church of God coming before him. How much do you pray? How full is your prayer being? Right? It, it makes sense, right? How alive are you in Christ? How vibrant is your church? How much do you pray? It is a, a recognized certain discourse between you and God. And, you know, vain repetition does not do it. Because it doesn't have a personal relationship with God. Those written prayers a lot of people do in certain churches. You know, all in my, uh, it, it makes no sense to the Lord. It's like, you, you're not connecting with me. You're, you're repeating something somebody else wrote. Connect with me. Talk to me like I am your friend because I am your friend. Talk to me like I am your dad because I am your dad. Talk to me like I am your savior because I did save you. Talk to me like I love you because I love you so much that I gave my only son so that you would not perish but have everlasting life. Talk to me like you know me because you should if you are my child. Know me. 
A lot of us have kids and we don't know them and they don't know us. Lack of communication. God does not deal with us that way. He has an overflow of communication. He says that He gives so much that it comes out of you. It pours out of you. People think they marry favor because they display outwardly. Right? So, some people, you ask them, brother, pray for their food, and they're like, Lord, six hours later, <coughs> they say amen, and you're like, brother, you forgot to pray for the food. <laughs> so, it, it, it's another extreme, right? So, they don't have a filter. You're like, bro, pray like that in your closet, but nobody's hearing you, so the Lord actually would hear your prayer, but don't do it in front of the congregation, because now you're trying to get brownie points. Have you ever had somebody like them? God is not impressed. He's not impressed. Religious men are all about external. And Jesus points it out in Matthew 6, 15, 5 to 15. He points it out to us. And he says the following. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. It's all outward. It's all outward, right? Truly I say to you, they have their uh, reward in full. But when you pray, go into the inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who, is, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be, uh, they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for, you, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Prayer is an intimate thing with God. You know, when somebody asks you to pray for something, be direct. That, that's my best advice. And when somebody asks you to pray for them, pray right now. You're going to forget by the time you get home. Don't be telling people you're going to pray and forget about them. Somebody says, I have an issue. Pray for me. Say, come here, brother. Come here, sister. Let me pray for you right now. Because if I forget, at least I know I pray for you once. So when you see them, and they're like, God did a miracle. Thank you for praying for me. Like, oh, my God. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and they're thanking you because supposedly you prayed. So as we, as we see this, you know, we, we, we must understand that the prayer, it, it, is, it is a beautiful thing when used properly. Real prayer is composed in the human heart and is longing for a love connection with your creator. That is real prayer. That is ultimate prayer. And with this said, let's look at our verse, and, and, and I'll be real brief, I'm, I'm serious. You're not going to believe me. I don't believe myself. Luke 2, 36 to 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna. Now, Anna is the same name as Hannah. You guys remember her from the Old Testament? Now, Hannah was known for prayer. Anna is known for prayer. It's kind of cool. The daughter of, of, of Fanuel, Fanu, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84. So, I, 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 like I said, I don't know if she's 104 or she's 84. Okay. She did not leave the temple grounds serving night and day with uh, fast and prayer. And at the very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak about Him to all of those who were looking forward to the redemption, redemption of Jerusalem. Now let me tell you, people who pray are people of this position. She was at the she didn't leave the church. Some 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 people who work for the church feel like like I, I haven't left. I can feel like no, but she really literally lived in the church. In the temple, there was this little let's call them condominiums apartments for the priest, and she was there as a as a monument of a place that they probably gave her one. They're like you know, Anna, you just, this is yours. You're here praying all the time. You're here 
worshiping all the time. I, I mean, just stay there. That's the kind of person that the worship she had. People who pray are people of this position. They're ready to act. They're ready to do because their hearts and the spirit are connected to the creator. And they know that if God calls, they should listen and they should do. Really, every ministry in the church is a matter of this position. Are you ready? Are you available? Are you available? And Anna, uh, who was at least 84, um, verse 36 uh, and 7, she could argue, look, I am tired. She's not under a fort, she's really tired. I lack energy. Or like most of us, even by 50, I am sick. Right? Diabetes, hypertension, and this goes on and on. And she was a widow uh, all her life. She could complain about, you know what, you don't know all the work I had to do by myself. <laughs> there was no man to do it for me. She could have complained of that. If she had kids, I had to raise them all by myself. It, the Bible doesn't say, I'm just saying. Is it not our excuses? I got children. I got to go to work. I got three jobs. Who does it in Hawaii? <laughs> if you're living in Hawaii, you at least have two. People who pray are people of action, beloved. People of action. She was always in the temple, verse 37. She had her ear to the ground, helping those in need. She learned of their needs, and she was always in the temple, being able to do something for the people who had the necessity. You know why a lot of times we don't know who our neighbor is in church that has been there for 20 years? Because we don't come to prayer meetings. Or because we don't request prayer from the church. But if we let our, our needs be known, people will know you better. Oh, well, that's why the brother never gets tired. Never had a job for like seven years. But, oh well, yeah, when you saw him, oh, that's, that's the only guy that never gets tired. But for seven years, maybe the church has been praying for him to have a job mm -hmm. or to get over an illness. But you don't know that. But we're quick to judge, right? Slow to pray. <laughs> Slow to pray. And that's what happens when you come to prayer readings. You start to get to know the innermost parts of the person. Because remember, prayer is intimate between you and God. But also when you bring it before the church, it's still an intimate thing that is known to the church. And that we, we can love on you and care for you even better. She never left the temple. She served and worshipped 24 hours a day. She worshiped night and day. The servant was with, with full devotion, fasting and prayer. Now, fasting by itself is nothing. But fasting, when you fast and say, Lord, Lord, I'm not going to eat so that I can devote myself to prayer, then it's something. It becomes spiritual. Right? Like I said last time, sometimes people fast for an hour and they put ashes on their head. Like, ooh. <laughs> You mean festival? Yeah, I love an hour. <laughs> but donut and the coffee, right? And the head off. I'm fasting, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's what happens. But, but when, when it's truly, you're saying, look, I'm going to devote myself to, to, to the day of prayer. And, and you lack food so that you can actually remember to pray. And you, you're using your body's uh, natural alarm of, I got to eat, to say, I got to pray. You know that that's sad? That we don't have an alarm that tells you you gotta pray? So you gotta use the alarm, uh, the biggest muscle you have, for most of us, <laughs> to let you know you gotta pray. So fasting and praying. People who pray are devotional people. She was present with many, uh, uh, with, with Mary and with Joseph, and, and she was there at the temple, in verse 38. She participated in the time of thanksgiving to God. They were bringing Christ. They were going to give a thanksgiving that the Lord has come. And, and she was part of the few who participated in the worship of, of Christ and, and, and knowing that God had fulfilled his promise to the Jewish people. The Messiah was here. It's funny that, that, that the verse starts that, that, she, that, that uh, she got there, arrived there right on time, right? Because she was always there. And you think about a place where there's about a thousand people there, and she shows up right on time, right where Jesus is at. I mean, divine providence. 
That's why you pray. That's why you pray so God directs your path. Now, Spurgeon, a 19th century English preacher and pastor, um, he had a bunch of new pastors go look at his church and ministry because he had about 5,000 people showing up at church. And he had no sound, no sound system, so no sound guy, really. <laughs> but everybody heard him clear, so he had a, he had a large voice. And these ministers uh, wanted to see that, you know, what's going on? What, how's your church? How, how is this big, big, a beautiful church? And after they saw the church, it's like, hey, let me take you to the boiler room. And they're like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. We don't need to go to the boiler room, Pastor. No, 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 you, you have to come and see the boiler room. No, Pastor, we don't want to. Come on, you're going to see the boiler room. He takes them down into the basement. And there's about 100 people in their knees praying. And, and, and they're like, what's going on here? Well, this is the secret to my ministry. Things are happening above because people below are praying. Hello? God moves when his people pray. Spurgeon knew that, so he's like, I'm going to put a boy in the room. I'm going to put my people to pray below so when I'm preaching about the, the gospel would reach people, change people, change community, change the church, bring revival, and nothing's going to happen unless people are praying. So he knew that, and he put people to pray while he preached. Well, I hope every church has a boy in the room. Right? You want to see community change? Let's start praying. So here we go. First, God has made himself accessible through prayer. So please pray because he, he made himself accessible. Second, God, God is the Son, uh, God the Son and God the Spirit both work to help us pray effectively. Jesus is the doorway to every prayer. In whose name should we pray? He's the doorway. And the Spirit of God takes the prayer to Christ and Christ presents it to the Father so that he will react to the prayer in a favorable way towards you. That's awesome. Third, prayer uh, offers remarkable promises. He, 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 Jesus said a prayer. You know, you receive not because you what? Ask not. Fourth, prayer is an inspired grace from God, dwelling spirit. If you know that you feel like praying, it's because you have the Spirit of God who's enticing you as a child of God to come before the King and let Him know your, your, your needs or your praise. Fifth, prayer releases us from sin and fear of Satan. Right? You resist the devil, resist him in prayer. And he'll what? Flee from you. Sixth, prayer comforts and encourages us. We know that we have a loving Father. We know that we're not alone in this. When, when people start asking for prayer, I'm sick, and they're like, what's wrong with you? I got a cough. And then somebody says, oh, man, I'm dealing with, you know, cancer. And God has been faithful. And you're like, my cough is nothing. <laughs> my cough, that's gone. But it encouraged me that somebody who has something worse is saying, look, it's going to be fine. It's going to be all right. Seven, although prayer is not natural to the unbeliever, it is natural and it is a must for the people who have the Spirit of God in us. Eight, God hears and answers prayer according to His will. And that's, that's the best thing you can do. You know, when I was a, a, a teenager and I was running around like a fool, saying there is no God, my mom simply said, Psh, I'm putting you in prayer, boy. <laughs> She had hit me, she had punished me, she took everything away. And, and when she said, she put, whoa, 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 <laughs> you're going to do what? <laughs> I'm putting you on prayer. I'm telling everybody to pray for you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Boy, tell you what, changes your life. When I was 16, I was on my knees in front of the altar getting baptized, receiving Christ and then going right into the wash because of my mom prayed. I know as parents we try everything. The kids go nuts, they start doing all these worldly things and we you know we're doctors and psychologists and you know this and that. Start praying. See God do something miraculously with your kids. Nine prayers are evidence of com conversion. 
you don't pray, there's nothing new in you. Then prayer is an act of love for others and for yourself and for God. If at all, pray because you love God. Be thankful that He saved you. Eleven, prayer is obedience. There is not, if, if you pray, it, it, there's not that in the Bible. If you pray, no, it's when you pray. You're not going to see if you pray in the Bible. Paul says, I assume you're praying when you pray. Do you pray? And that's the question that we got to answer for ourselves if we're spiritual people. Because dead people, dead men, don't pray. Hello? If you don't have a prayer, let me, if you take anything away, dead men don't pray. Take that with you. Put it in your pocket. Next prayer meeting, this place will be violent. Okay? Those made alive in Christ are alive. And those are the ones that pray. A believer who prays is, a, is assured of his own salvation. They know that they're, they're a child of God. God has made you a spiritual being, born of the Spirit, so that you can be and, and do spiritual things. And one of the spiritual things, and the, one of the most wonderful spiritual things you can do to show your love for God and others is to pray for yourself, for others, to God, trusting that He will do according to His perfect will. You clone your father. You better be talking to him. Do you pray in the name of Christ? Have you felt the power of the Spirit of God in your prayers? Then let your prayers be a test to determine whether you are really a child of God. You know what I do when I evangelize somebody? After I share scripture, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, but hearing, right? I share scripture with them and I and simply I just take them to the scriptures and read it out loud, brother. And they read it out loud, and they stumble to it, okay, let's slow it down and read it again. And they read it again. Okay, what does it mean to you? I'm not going to explain it to you. Why? Because salvation is not mine. Salvation is of the Lord. The Spirit of God has to be working, right? And they tell me, oh, it means this and that. Well, read it again, because you're like, over there, it's supposed to be going this way. <laughs> And they read it again. And so what does it say to you? They're just saying things that I know they're, you know, in, in, in Christ, Christianese. So I'm like, yeah, you're, you're on the full part. You're getting there. And we go through scriptures like that. And when they're done, and I ask them, what are you supposed to do according to scripture? Pray and ask for forgiveness. Well, what do you do that? I don't know how. Well, just tell God how you feel. Tell him what you just read. And, and let him know that you want a change in your life. And this... And they do the most, you know, if, if truly the Spirit of God is working, they'll pray better than you ever have, ever. Spirit of the Lord. You know that. That's it. Your spirit knows the Spirit of God. You let them evangelize themselves. You just got to work the plan, right? It's God's plan. As an Anglican Bishop of London, uh, Riley once said, do not lose heaven for what you're asking. Oh. When I read that, I was like, yeah, you're right. Sometimes we're asking for the wrong thing. Call upon God in the name of Jesus and make your request known before Him and ask the Spirit of God to lead you, to guide you in prayer so that your prayer will be something that God wants to hear from your mouth and from your heart, not some nonsense from your brain. Call home. Let them know, Father, Spirit, Son, I am coming soon and I will see you and I will be with you always and forever. Let them know I'm coming home. Because you are. You're a child of God. Call every day. Call through the day. God is listening to you. God will answer your call according to His perfect will for you. <coughs> you know that the, the words that a pastor loves to hear from the congregation? <laughs> pastor, we're praying for you. <coughs> That pastor feels love. 
Prayer is disposition, action, and devotion. Do you pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to see a picture of heaven, a picture of the spirit that in us, a picture of Christ, a picture of the church, a, pe a, a people who are gathered through the loving grace of God, sending his son, his son that, uh, pouring out the blood to cleanse us of all sin and the spirit applying the blood to every individual so that we may know and we may know you as a father. A father who wants to have communication and communion with us. A father who loves the fact that the children are thank thankful for all you provide. While everybody prays, if, if you're not a person of prayer, but you want to change that in your life, would you stand? If, 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 if you think about it, you know, do you pray like Anna? 24-7? If, if you're not there, would you stand? No shame. No shame. It's a fact. I'm standing already. I was the first one up here. <laughs> but if you're a person of, uh, who's interested in, in devouring the scriptures and, the, and, and devoting to the prayer, and you're not doing it effectively, please stand. Father, bless those who are standing. Thank you, Father, because we can repent of our sin and come to you in grace. Come to you and you will love us. Come to you and you will change us. Spirit of God, take over our lives that we would be people of prayer. People who constantly seek to talk to you as our Father. People who constantly are communicating with you. People who constantly are believing you. People who constantly feel the Spirit of God growing us in righteousness in the image of Christ. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor you will bring, Father. And I know that this church will be praying for him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The Lord bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you.
conclude this morning. Um, I'd just like to thank you again. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful message um, that we really, um, all of us need to continue to prayer. I don't think any of us, um, if we were really true about it, do it 24-7. And so, um, just praise God for the message today. Thank you. So I'll see you guys all at the next prayer meeting. <laughs> all right we're gonna end our um service this morning with revive us again and i'm gonna have uncle jim close us after that